And now, as, uh, as you're stretching, I'd like to have the inventors panel to come up. Um, we are going to be able to um, uh, hear from people who are developing waste to energy programs that can take a waste stream and make 30% more methane than ever thought possible before. So eventually, we could have all of our waste and water treatment facilities self-powered. So if a grid were to go down, water would still be available and sewage treatment would be available. Come up, please. And uh, yes, come in. Uh, man. Oh, sorry about that. That's okay. Um, yes, that's all right. We've got a, pardon me? Uh, uh, well, I'll announce it. Make certain we just have a chance to. Yes, it goes here, and I need to. Uh, so we'd we'll be ready in just one moment. We'll also be talking about some cyber inventions that will make your grid, or, or not only your grid, but your network far more secure. And um, we will also um, be talking about a building that we're doing for research in Frostburg, among others, that's totally off-grid. We have a 6,300-square-foot building that does not need one drop of oil or a dime's worth of electricity off the grid. And it's in Frostburg, Maryland, which gets chilly every once in a while, and you will hear about that. Um, so we will just take one moment more to uh, get the slides ready, and then we'll be ready to go. This group will move very quickly uh, because they're each going to take five minutes. It's going to be like commercials on the Super Bowl. Um, uh, programs and then uh, afterwards we're going to hear from the person who directs cyber education for DHS and cyber awareness and if you have friends at universities who uh, uh, would like to participate and be funded in their programs this, uh, that will be a, a session you'd definitely like to hear and then later we will have uh, another session on EMP grid related issues and a next steps conversation with those of you who can still be here. So, um, so let me see a couple of you have um, uh, I just put in a thumb drive for someone. Uh, come on up, John, and let me make certain I. Um, okay, it would be this, and it would be this, and um, so, and then view. We will do presenter view. Okay, and so uh, in a moment, um, John Spears is going to begin to talk about uh, some work. You'll see a big poster board out in the hallway from Frostburg State University, and it talks about that facility, which is totally off-grid. And we have been thinking a lot about getting people to consider making 20% of their own power, because you could probably get by with that, or whatever you think the amount is. It could be 30 or 40%, like Ambassador Woolsey mentioned. Here's a group that is already doing it 100% off-grid, and he also has developed uh, townhomes in Frederick, Maryland, that are, when you figure in the cost of fuel and everything, I think are is no more expensive than a normal townhome. So with that, I'd like John Spears to come up for three to four minutes and uh, give you an orientation of what he's doing in Frostburg, Frederick, and places that give us confidence that we certainly can go 20% off grid if you're doing it 100, right, John? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. Um, I'm an architect and a builder. I've been building zero energy, solar powered homes since the early 70s. And we've also been doing work around the world in underdeveloped countries to help places that don't have electricity or don't have access to infrastructure, clean water, housing, uh, electricity, sanitation, communications, uh, develop that infrastructure in a sustainable way. What I want to talk about today, very briefly, is just show you some examples about not only how it's possible, but how we've been doing it in a variety of different ways to make buildings grid independent. We've heard the term zero energy, solar power, and so on. But grid independent, that means they, are, they operate on the grid, but when the grid goes down, all central services continue to operate until the grid can come back uh, almost indefinitely because of the solar, um, the solar power. Um, this concept is illustrated here I basically introduced this back in 1984 to the National Association of Home Builders uh, at the Research Center while I was the senior architect there. And this is where we took a conventional tracked home and, and asked the question, how do we make this completely self-sufficient? We didn't have the term green and all those sorts of things back then. So we were talking about the environmentally responsible homes or totally self-sufficient homes. 
So the technology we're talking about is not new. The stuff I did in the 70s is exactly the same stuff I'm doing today. Things are, happen to be a lot more cost effective and maybe a little bit more efficient, but they're not different. Um, in developing countries where people don't have what we have, they have nothing, um, I saw a need for that and developed this, what I call earth homes, that are completely self-sufficient housing that doesn't require the development of an infrastructure for water, sewer, and electricity for our communities to be built. All that infrastructure is built into the house. Solar for electricity, rainwater collection for clean water, which is essential, dry composting toilets to create organic fertilizer uh, for the gardens that are, that are irrigated by the gray water from the sinks and the showers. Um, and the buildings are built out of compressed earth bricks that are made on site with a machine that compresses dirt into structural and thermal mass bricks, keeps the building comfortable as well. We build these houses, million dollar versions of this here in the States, and versions for very, very poor people in developing countries. So when, if you pose the question, let's say you're building a new house, or you want to make your house uh, resilient to grid interruptions. What do you need? So looking at each one of the components, first thing you need might think about is heat. So you can heat a house. Um, first, you want to make it as efficient as possible so it doesn't need a huge amount of heat. The second thing, if you let the sun in, the south-facing windows, that can provide a significant amount of heat. Call that passive solar design. Natural gas is much less interruptible if you will, uh, than electricity, and it's a good bet, particularly here, or you could get a supply of propane if you needed to. And then, of course, there's always a wood stove uh, that could use as a backup for heating. Hot water, again, natural gas or propane, is a good way. You just need a little electricity for the igniter, which can be a battery. Um, a solar water heater works quite well, uh, and biomass, which is, again, wood. Lights high efficiency lighting so you don't need a whole lot of electricity. And then other things like communications, refrigeration, well water, and other electrical needs. Primarily we're looking at solar, PV, photovoltaics, with batteries for providing that. And in some limited cases we have wind where we have a site that is uh, windy and you can use the wind. And then the last option would be a gas generator. That's a natural gas generator. So I'm just going to flip through a few projects to illustrate what we're talking about. This happens to be my office, which is grid in independent. Uh, we have solar and batteries and passive solar and all those things I just described. Um, this is an array of projects I want to talk about, each one of those a little bit independently. Um, back, uh, Ambassador Wellesley talked about uh, Y2K. I got a number of um, requests for buildings to be grid independent during the Y2K. This is a Buddhist temple, a farm in Virginia, a uh, housing project in Virginia, 100% solar powered with batteries, um, utility bills that are zero. It's another benefit of having this kind of a technology. This is the school that Chuck mentioned, Frostburg State University. Uh, it's uh, about a 6,500 square foot building. 100% um, off-grid. There's no fossil fuels being used in this building at all. It runs completely on solar and wind and batteries. And there is a small hydrogen fuel cell making the hydrogen with the solar and wind, with the excess solar and wind. An environmental education center, which also grows food. A retrofit of a house in D.C., conventional uh, home in D.C. A new house in Falls Church, Virginia. Uh, this one's so efficient it just uses a water heater, gas water heater for its heating system. This is a house we've just completed in Frederick, Maryland. It's 100% off-grid uh, with batteries, wind, and solar. Um, this is basically what the system looks like. You've got a small battery bank with some inverters and a wind turbine. We talked briefly about water. It rains enough here, get all the water you need. You just collect it off the roof, store it in a tank filter it and put a little UV light on it, and it's perfectly sanitized. Um, the last project I want to talk about are basically spec homes. The cost of these things is not the issue. 
This is a series of townhomes. We're building 58 zero energy townhomes in Frederick, Maryland. These things start in the mid 200s. And if you look at the cash flow, comparing this house, mortgage plus utility bills, to a conventional house, you'll find that this 100% solar powered house costs less by about 90 bucks a month. I'm sorry, a year. No, I'm sorry, a month. Um, 90 bucks a month less to own the solar house than to own the conventional house. So it's not about technology. It's not about money. It's just about the will to do it. Thank you.